We move on to our sixth presentation now at the um, British Columbian Camp 1983 and uh, this of course is uh, the 10 o'clock study on Sunday morning. We go right back now to the theme we were considering last night in respect to the training of children and of course we looked at that because of the need to develop holy children in whom is the spirit of obedience and the spirit of faith because a, an obedient person and a faith-filled person is a holy person as we read of course from Acts the Apostles page 5.1 and it is only through a holy people that God can in the end finish his work so very obviously those who attain to the highest levels of holiness should be those who from their earliest years have been trained in this pathway when God says to us train up a child in the way that he shall go when he is old he will not depart from it that is a training in the pathway of holiness which is a training in the pathway of obedience and faith which of course requires not the curbing of the spirit of disobedience but the implanting within the child of the spirit of obedience that's the only way that we can possibly go in that direction now I'd like to spend a few moments uh, looking at a common reaction to such a presentation I'm very familiar with the fact, as you are too, of course, that uh, when we have an, uh, an idea embedded in our minds through long, long usage and it, it becomes a habit, it's very difficult for us to see the new principles that God desires to teach us. And we tend to find the new ideas are clouded by the old. And no better example of this can be given, of course, than the apostles of Jesus Christ who came into his service with very erroneous ideas about the kingdom and despite the fact that the greatest teacher of all time very earnestly worked to deliver them from those wrong ideas, you'll be find that right down to the crucifixion they still had not seen through their errors and grasped the principles that Christ had for them. And we too are, like, uh, are liable to keep reverting back to the old way of thinking again. Now, as we saw last night, there are several ways of bringing up children one is to let them just run wild as some parents find themselves forced to do another way of course is to use the the whip to use chastisement which definitely produces a better result if wisely administered very obviously of course if an angry parent uses the whip or the or the switch to uh, to um, express his emotions and uh, bring the child into order that is a very very bad procedure too but then there's the way which has been adopted by some people and commendable up to a point that they take the child aside, they talk to him about the principles of obedience, then they pray with the child and they give it a good licking. And um, <clears throat> the parents are then very confident that because they prayed about the matter, the whole process had been sanctified and that the end result is going to be very, very successful. What we have to learn is this, that there is a true science to prayer and that there is prayer and there is prayer. As um, Sister White says in Education, page 257, in the prayer of faith, and, and that's the only kind of prayer that works, of course, there is a divine science. It is a science which everyone who would make his life work a success must understand. You know, very shortly, probably before this day, as I will start on the true science of prayer, in connection with the statement that the open door is set before us by he that is holy and uh, I'm not exhausting any one of these sections of our study initially I'm, I want to bring them all together and carry all three sections along together that is brotherly love on the first case in the first case secondly the fact that Jesus Christ as the Holy One is presented to the Philadelphian Church and thirdly of course that he has set before us the open door into the very presence of God by a new and living way through the veil, that is to say, his flesh, as we read in Hebrews chapter 10. Now I want to spend just a short moment or two now demonstrating the fact that there are prayers and there are prayers. Let's go back to a study with which you're all familiar, I'm quite certain, that is the study of the deliverance of Israel from the land of Egypt. And let me just make some quick main points in regard to this. Let's, let's say that here we have one of those uh, great blocks of stone that the Israelites were preparing for... Um, the pyramids or one of those great cities Python and Ramesses that they built back there 
Of course, many, many of them made bricks out of straw and clay as well, but they must have done some stonework as well. And here's an Israelite bending over the stone. I mean, my drawing this picture before, I'm sure that is hammer and chisel. And of course, in the background, we have the taskmaster who stands over him with the ever ready whip over his shoulder, ready to whip that man into submission if he doesn't obey the word of the king of Egypt. Now, this Israelite had a very real problem from which he could not deliver himself. And he would go at the end of the day and he would kneel down beside his bed, at least we imagine that he did. Here's his bed and here's his bedroom window with the moon outside. And here he is kneeling in prayer with his head bowed before God as he says his evening prayers. Now, <clears throat> the kind of prayer, that I can imagine those folks saying back there, is the kind of prayer which we know folk pray today. In other words, he would say, Lord, today I recognize that I spent my entire day building up Satan's kingdom, and that would be a very truthful confession. Then he would say, Lord, I'm very sorry I spent the day doing that. Would you please forgive me? Now, his sorrow and regret, of course, would be very genuine in the case of a truly conscientious Israelite back at that time. And there were such people as truly conscientious Israelites in the land of Egypt. Not too many, but they were were there. And he would plead with God to forgive him for doing that all day, and then he would ask God to help him not to do it tomorrow. But that prayer, sincere as it was, well-meaning as it was, did not solve that man's problem. Because when he finished praying that prayer, what, what was he still? A slave. So had to go to bed as a slave, had to wake up in the morning, still a slave. So what must he do the next day? The same things all over again. So he sinned and confessed to go back and sin some more and to confess some more and sin and confess and so forth. In other words, the nature of that prayer did not contain the necessary elements to bring him deliverance from Egyptian bondage. And so, as he prayed that prayer every night, he followed that prayer every day by going back to a life of servitude to the Egyptian power. There is a true science to prayer, and when we're talking about our children being delivered from the spirit of disobedience, that prayer must take a very, very definite form, although even the form itself is not adequate if there's no living faith mixed with that presentation. And in the true science of prayer, which will, this is just a little summary of it, we'll have more on it, of course, when we come to the the complete study of it in, in a few sessions from now, in the true science of prayer, there must first of all be in the part of the parent a recognition of that child's need. Now, it might not be, might not be physically apparent. There are some parents who, who are blessed with very mild-natured, ch- mild-natured children, and these children in their earlier years do not exhibit very openly a spirit of rebellion, and the parent therefore fondly imagines that, they, that her or his or their child is different, and has been born without the curse of a spirit of disobedience. Let's face the fact that the scripture said we're all born in sin, every one of us. And while some children manifest this more openly than others, other, others are very cunning in some cases, or they're very mild natured in some cases, but every child is born with a spirit of disobedience. <clears throat> and so the first thing the parent must recognize is the need for deliverance from that spirit. <clears throat> Now secondly, the parent must themselves be familiar with the great promises of God and have experienced them in their own case. They must know that the word of God says, the Lord says, I will save your children. <clears throat> There's only one means <clears throat> ordained of God to save our children or anybody else for that matter, and that's the gospel of Jesus Christ. As Paul says in Romans chapter 1, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. So the gospel is the power of God to save. So when God says, I will save your children, what is he thereby saying he will use to bring about that salvation? The gospel. There's no other way, because the gospel is the power of God to save from sin. That's why... In Matthew 1 verse 21, the angel said to Joseph, the husband of Mary, who had become the mother of Jesus, Thou shalt call his name Jesus, because or for he shall save his people from their sins, which means, of course, from their sinfulness. Then, having recognized the child's need, having grasped the promises of God, the parent then kneels down very specifically confesses that child's problem. He says, My child has in him the spirit of disobedience a very specific confession 
we don't ask God to help the child we don't, we don't ask God to bless the child we say Lord we confess the presence in that child of this wicked thing that specific confession is critically necessary to the success of this approach to this problem and then we then then on the child's behalf on the baby's behalf we then give to God that evil spirit of disobedience we absolutely believe he's taken it and then by faith we, we ask God to put into our child the seed of Jesus Christ which is the spirit of obedience and then we thank God for the blessing and go our way knowing that the miracle has taken place knowing it we don't wait to see if um, future evidence will confirm the fact as we read in Steps to Christ page 51 do not wait to feel that you made whole but say I believe it it is so not because I feel it but because God has promised 51 Steps to Christ <coughs> and this, this stepping out by faith of course is very very essential and I'll labour that point quite extensively when we come to the study of the true science of prayer now last I study on um, train up a child in the way that he shall go when he's old he will not depart from it of course was will bring the greatest benefit to those who have very young children now and those in turn who plan to marry and will have children later you're the fortunate ones and that study was, was particularly for you <coughs> It also helped us older ones to recognize how unwittingly, despite our best intentions, we, we made a very bad job bringing up our children. And I can speak for myself, and no doubt you, you folk can speak for yourselves as well. I want now to bring a message of encouragement to those of us who have come along the way, and uh, our children are grown up and have got out of hand, and uh, in, in most cases gone out into a life in the world. Let's go back to the book of Daniel, shall we? <clears throat> and um, when I was at the Portuguese camp about oh, six weeks ago now I suppose it was more closer to yeah, about six weeks ago the folk there requested that we spend the camp in the study of Daniel and um, a very very powerful thought came through to me which uh, to me was a tremendous encouragement a tremendous encouragement and it was that upon the throne of the world at that time was a great anti-Christian king whose name was Nebuchadnezzar. And if you were to ask today for the modern counterpart of that king, who would you name? The Pope of Rome, correct? Right? The Pope of Rome. And if you, if you were to be, uh, if it was suggested to you that the Pope of Rome was going to be converted and be, become a member of this movement, what would you say? You'd say impossible, wouldn't you? You'd say that's the last person I'd expect to become a member of this movement. But the facts are that's what happened in Nebuchadnezzar. And if the Pope of Rome today was converted to the gospel, it would be no less or more a, a, a revelation of God's power to save than was exhibited back in the days of Daniel. <coughs> now God, of course, loved King Nebuchadnezzar, and God loves your wayward children. He, he, doesn't, he didn't love Nebuchadnezzar more than he loves mine my or your wayward children he loves them all the same and desires to see the salvation of your wayward children as much as he desired to see the, the deliverance of uh, Nebuchadnezzar from the, from the bondage of sin now God was blessed back there with a, a, an instrument in the person of Daniel who understood and practiced the Sabbath rest principles I hope you folks heard the tapes from the Arkansas camp a, num a number of years ago if you didn't you should hear them in which we went through the book of Daniel verse by verse and covered the entire book in one camp quite an achievement really for us to do that but we did it and um, when you go through the life story of Daniel you find a man who as a result of the training given to him by God through Jeremiah the prophets understood and practiced the Sabbath rest principles to perfection so much so that there never was a single occasion in the life of Daniel when the powers of darkness ever got the better of him which was a stupendous victory when you think about it because Daniel stood alone against the mightiest king with all the power of that king which the world at that time knew and that king of course was Nebuchadnezzar Nebuchadnezzar had the armies of the world he had the uh, police forces of the world he had all the power at his command he could just snap his fingers and heads would roll, literally roll I mean he would be beheaded, literally and yet Daniel under God's guidance with God as the problem solver and the plan maker withstood that king and not only won every battle against the king or that the king brought against him 
but also ended up in effecting the conversion of that king so you can expect to find King Nebuchadnezzar in the kingdom of heaven and I'll take a moment now to read the statement from the Bible commentary volume 4 where Sister White tells us that King Nebuchadnezzar eventually was thoroughly converted and learned to love and to praise the God of heaven but the reference is, is volume 4 uh, page 1170 Bible commentary volume 4 page 1170 in, <clears throat> in Daniel's life the desire to glorify God was the most powerful of all motives now if the desire to glorify God was the most powerful of all motives in the life of Daniel do you suppose he had the spirit of obedience very obviously right very obviously he realized that when standing in the presence of men of influence a failure to acknowledge God as a source of his wisdom would have made him an unfaithful steward and his constant recognition of the God of heaven before kings princes and statesmen detracted not one iota from his influence King Nebuchadnezzar before whom Daniel so often honored the name of God was finally thoroughly converted and learned to praise and extol and honor the king of heaven he was finally thoroughly converted now King Nebuchadnezzar was by no means a saint in, in, in any sense of that word he was a, uh, a man with a tremendous temper a man who had lots of blood in his hands he was a dictator a despot an absolute monarch who ruled the world with an iron will and he had anything to lose and nothing much to gain from the earthly point of view if he did become a Christian and yet we find he became just that and I find that God set up a situation uh, knowing of course that Daniel was there as a faithful agent or, or instrument upon this earth through whom God could work mm -hmm. so it was God who came down to Nebuchadnezzar and gave that man a dream without the memory of it God did that it was a situation which God personally organized and, and God knew he could safely do this because of the presence of Daniel and because he knew Daniel would not fail in this time of test and, um, and need and so Daniel stood to his uh, post did the part that God had designed for him to do and in this first encounter King Nebuchadnezzar emerged very very deeply convinced of the rightness of God's truth and was prepared to even worship Daniel and to make him a great man in the land of Babylon which of course he had the power to do now, as I read that story and saw how God had personally set that situation up in order to effect, to eventually affect the, the, the conversion of King Nebuchadnezzar and when I saw how when King Nebuchadnezzar reverted back from his own uh, witness or his own testimony and then built that great golden image in the plains of Durham and yet God with great patience turned that to the salvation of King Nebuchadnezzar and when Nebuchadnezzar's pride grew uh, great and he was he, his mind broke down and he fled for seven years to, to live with the cattle and the beasts in the field God was still there watching over him and after all those many years probably lasting well those seven years when he was out in the fields maybe 10 or 15 years altogether I don't know exactly how long it was and yet over all that long period of time God never gave up working to save that man's soul and finally succeeded now the thought came to me with powerful emphasis now if the God of heaven would go to all that trouble to save that king then what would he do to save my children if I in faith commit the task to him is that, is that an encouraging thought for every parent that finds his or her child out there in the, the world of darkness now today we can regret as we do the years of ignorance and they're many and the mistakes that uh, come through in those years of ignorance which also are many but let's turn now to Joel just beyond the book of Daniel Joel chapter 1 and um, my mind turned right to this particular passage of scripture when I thought in terms of um, the salvation of my children because of course a very important factor now in God's working mightily for your children is, is the fact that like as God had Daniel to stand to his post of duty Daniel only ever asked two questions what are my orders and what are the promises and when we will stand as, as God's instruments as Daniel stood as God's instrument then God of course can work much more effectively to answer our prayers than if um, we were still uh, living in the delusion of previous errors now let's turn now to Joel the first chapter begin with verse 1 
the word of the Lord that came to Joel the son of Petuel hear this you old men and give ear all you inhabitants of the land hath this been in your days or even in the days of your fathers tell ye your children of it and let your children tell their children and their children another generation that which the palmer worm hath left hath the locust eaten and that which the locust hath left hath the canker worm eaten and that which the canker worm hath left hath the caterpillar eaten Awake you drunkards and weep and howl all you drinkers of wine because of the new wine for it is cut off from your mouth and so on. Now when you think back of over those, those sad years and we can really see today I'm talking now of course to parents who have grown up and departed children such as I myself have but as, you cast, as we cast our eyes back over the years can't we see a wasting and a desolation caused by wrong ideas and wrong principles? and wrong practices and wrong procedures and um, we, we look and say well now we've, we've, we've just simply lost all that time and, and we can't regain it and we wish we could go back and relive those years and have the sheer joy of seeing our children grow up possessed of the spirit of obedience filled with the love of God children that are dedicated to God and to the, their parents and to each other families that are true reflections of the glory of the heavenly family above and and that's what God designed families should be and that's what um, those of you who have young children today can enjoy uh, as your families grow up and um, you'll be the envy of us who've gone before but the Lord says that not at all is not lost by any manner of means at all now I wonder what sort of education Nebuchadnezzar had as a child Certainly, um, I expect it was a very pagan one, certainly a very Babylonian education, and it was not a training in the way that it should afterwards go, as far as God was concerned, but anything but that kind of training. And in the end, after many years of hard work on God's part, Nebuchadnezzar did finally go the way that God wished him to go and became a thoroughly converted Christian. Now, we're living at the, in the very shadow of the loud cry period. And... Um, in chapter 2 of course the rest of chapter 1 is a very interesting chapter to read because it talks about the desolation that has come as a result of these years that the locust and the canker worm and the palmer worm and the caterpillar hath, hath eaten and as we look upon our wayward children today we can certainly see that their hearts are desolate empty of the abiding presence of God's spirit not all is lost There's certainly some of the training we gave them is, is still uh, bearing its mark upon their lives for good but generally speaking of course the vine is dried up and the tree languisheth but there in chapter 2 there's the call to blow the trumpet in Zion and sound an alarm in my holy mountain that all the inhabitants of the land tremble for the day of the Lord cometh for it is nigh at hand a day of darkness of luminous a great battle as you read down to verse 11 and we know of course that the world today is assembling its forces for the last great showdown in human history now the Lord says in verse 12 therefore in other words because of what is coming therefore also now saith the Lord turn you even to me with all your heart and with fasting and with weeping and with mourning and rend your hearts and not your garments and turn unto the Lord your God for he is gracious and merciful slow to anger and of great kindness and repenteth him of the evil who knoweth if, if you return and repent and, and leave a blessing behind him even a meal offering and a drink offering unto the Lord your God. Blow the trumpet in Zion, sanctify a fast, call a solemn assembly. Gather the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children and those that suck the breasts, let the bridegroom go forth of his chamber and the bride out of her closet. Let the priests, the ministers of the Lord, weep between the porch and the altar, and let them say, Spare thy people, O Lord, and give not thine heritage to reproach, that the heathen should rule over them wherefore should they say among the people where is their God now the thing is that if we will do that and we are doing that this, this, um, this call is in fact the feast of trumpets which of course is the warning of coming judgment and the very messages God has been sent, sent to us over these last 10 or 15 or 20 years now have been a call to do what these verses say stand an alarm, call a solemn assembly gather the people, sanctify the elders and so forth 
Now if we do that, we have some very, very powerful promises given to us by God in the next verses. I'll read just a few, but there's one or two which in particular will claim our attention. Verse 25, for instance. And I'll restore to you the years that the locust have eaten, the canker worm and the caterpillar and the palmer worm, my great arm which I sent amongst you. So we don't need to be losers, do we? All that's been lost during those many, many years will be restored to us and uh, in great abundance. So let's read the intervening verses now to get the context to what we're looking at. From verse 18 on, Then will the Lord be jealous for his land and pity his people. Yea, the Lord will answer and say unto, the, unto his people, Behold, I will send you corn and wine and oil, and you shall be satisfied therewith, and I will no more make you a reproach among the heathen. But I will remove far, from, far off from you the northern army, and will drive him into a land barren and desolate, with his face toward the east sea, and his hind apart toward the utmost sea, and his stink shall come up, and his ill savour shall come up, because he hath done great things. Fear not, O land, be glad and rejoice, for the Lord will do great things. Be not afraid, you beasts of the field, for the pastures of the wilderness do spring, for the tree beareth her fruit, the fig tree and the vine do yield their strength. Be glad then, you children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he has given you the former rain moderately, and he will cause to come down for you the rain, the former rain and the latter rain in the first month. And the floor shall be full of wheat, and, th and the fat shall overflow with wine and oil. And I will restore to you the years that the locust have eaten, the canker worm, and the caterpillar, and the palmer worm, my great army which I have sent amongst you. And you shall eat in plenty, and be satisfied, and praise the name of the Lord your God, that has dealt wondrously with you, and my people shall never be ashamed. And you shall know that I am in the midst of Israel, and that I am the Lord your God and none else and my people shall never be ashamed now all that before the loud cry because it shall come to pass after all this as the next verse says that God pours his spirit upon all flesh and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy and so on now today I personally take tremendous courage from the fact that uh, first I look back and see all those wasted years wasted because of my ignorance and because of that Two of my children are out in the world. They do recognize, of course, that this is the message. They have no, no yen or any other uh, church or teaching. And um, they at times indicate that perhaps someday I'll come back. But I'm not concerned about that so much. I take great confidence from the fact that God will restore to us what we've lost through our ignorance. There's the promise of it. And every day now, having confessed to God my mistakes over those years and received his pardon and forgiveness, of course, Every day I, I ask God to send his mighty Holy Spirit to surround those young people with a very, very powerful influence, both they and their partners. The partners, of course, are worldly people who never ever had any Christian background we're talking about. <clears throat> now, I don't expect an instant miracle. I know there'll be no instant miracle. I'm not even, not even looking for that. Nor am I looking to see any visible tokens that anything is happening in the meantime. And I suppose that... Uh, for the first several years of Daniel's sojourn in the land of Babylon, he saw no indication that his prayers were being heard and Daniel was being worked upon by the Holy Spirit. It's like the seed in the soil. You plant it, you can't see a thing happening until eventually, of course, the plant bursts through the soil and begins to become a visible living entity. But I, I do rest today. I mean, I really rest today in the assurance that the Holy Spirit is working mightily upon the hearts of those young people and eventually... They're going to have to either resist that working or yield to it and take their place in God's kingdom. And so don't be discouraged if we older ones can look back and see those wasted years that the canker worm, the palmer worm and all those things have eaten because God says, I'll restore unto you what they have eaten and you shall eat in plenty and be satisfied and you shall be no more a reproach. Now what is one of the greatest reproaches that we have to face? The fact that our children turn their backs upon our message, isn't that right? That's one of our greatest reproaches. It's something which um, the heathen point to and say, well, if, if your home was really a Christian home, why are, your children, uh, why are your children so anxious to get out of it and get away from it? And that's one of the reproaches that the people of God have to face as they move on down through time. So I believe that it is well worth our while to learn how to train up our children the way that they should go in the way, by the correct procedures, 
so that when they're old we have the assurance they will not depart from it. And the fact that up until the present time the children have almost universally departed from the, from the way of their parents is clear proof that we have not been trained up in the way that they should go. Otherwise the promise will indeed be fulfilled. And when God says, I will save your children, remember, he saves them through the application of the gospel and we have a part to play in that just as much as God himself has. So let's come back now to Revelation chapter 3. Now we're by no means finished with the two aspects we looked at, namely the bodily love, nor with the fact that he is holy. But I want to now move on to the open door, which is placed before us into the very presence of God above. And then I want to t carry all these three things along together uh, as, they, as they do support each other and complement each other in this revelation given to us in the Word of God. Revelation 3 and verse 7 And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These things saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David, he that openeth and no man shutteth, and shutteth and no man openeth. I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it, for thou hast a little strength, and hast kept my word, and hast not denied my name. I should mention the key of David, of course, as we pass on through this verse, because it's a very vital element, too, in the revelation of Jesus Christ. Let's go back to the 22nd chapter of Isaiah and the 22nd verse, Isaiah 22 and verse 22. <clears throat> and uh, this is a prophecy it starts back in verse 20 it's a prophecy concerning Eliakim the son of Hilkiah now most if not all of the prophecies in the Old Testament that, that, are, that they speak about particular people have a secondary or really a primary application of Jesus Christ himself and what is said about Hilkiah in this particular reference does in fact have a direct bearing on the ministry of Jesus. So let's read now from verse 20. And it shall come to pass in that day that I will call my servant Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah, and I will clothe him with thy robe and strengthen him with thy girdle, and I'll commit thy government into his hand, and he shall be a father to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and to the house of David. And the key of the house of David will lay upon his shoulder, and he shall open and none shall shut and he shall shut and none shall open and I will fasten him as a nail in a sure place and he shall be for a glorious throne to his father's house now is this, is this language very like what we read in Revelation chapter 3 it is indeed and, you, and of course as has long been recognised the entire book of Revelation is really written in the Old Testament and it's just a matter of matching the Old Testament statements with those in the New Testament to see how in Revelation in fact all the books of the Bible meet and end now the house of David is like the house of Abraham the house of Jacob the house of Isaac or Isaac and Jacob or Isaac, and, Isaac and Israel as Jacob eventually came to be called now whereas the house of Levi for instance was the house of the priesthood what was the house of David the house of kingship or rulership or authority or government now, just keep our fingers more or less in Revelation, I mean Isaiah 22, and go back to Isaiah chapter 9. And um, we have there a very well known scripture which uh, doesn't use the word the house of David, but it does use the idea of government being upon his shoulder. Isaiah 9, verse 6. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder and his name should be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. In verse 7, Of the increase of his government and peace there shall be no end upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts shall perform this. So when we read in Revelation chapter 3, that he has the key of David this means the, the key of access to all authority and all power and that, that in this confused earthly situation that God is still upon his throne that God is an authority that God does have the power to finish his work and we can be assured 
that in the days of the Philadelphians that work will be brought to its end and Christ shall reign as King of Kings and Lord of Lords forevermore. Now let's move on to the open door. We could of course develop uh, the thought then the key of David quite extensively but I want to get on to the open door and accordingly we'll turn across to Revelation chapter 8. And um, I'll never forget uh, my experience at the Arkansas camp last year. We come down to this chapter and I had gone away to spend time in prayer before the next meeting or the first meeting on I think about Tuesday morning. And as I knelt there, this passage of scripture really opened up to my mind in the most remarkable fashion. I caught a vision, I don't mean a, a visible vision, but a, a spiritual vision of the role of Jesus Christ as our great intercessor. I saw, saw that role and the power of it as never before. And I just hope I can convey to you something of that inspiration this morning from Revelation the 8th chapter. Now let's begin with the uh, second verse. And I saw the seven angels which, had, which stood before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. And another angel came and stood at the altar, having a golden censer, and there was given unto him much incense, that he should offer it with the prayers of all saints upon the golden altar which was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense, which came with the prayers of the saints, ascended up before God out of the angel's hand. And the angel took the censer and filled it with the fire of the altar and cast it into the earth and there were voices and thunderings and lightnings and, a, and an earthquake. And the seven angels which had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound. Now we want to identify first of all who this angel is. Is he Gabriel? Christ. He's Christ. How do we know he's Christ? He has the censer in hand and our right. priest could do this. Exactly. No angel apart from Jesus Christ, the archangel, can officiate in the heavenly sanctuary carrying a golden censer in which, uh, uh, with which, in which there is incense with which he offers up with the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar. Now this is not the only time in Revelation that Jesus Christ is referred to as a mighty angel. Where's another instance that Christ is referred to as a mighty angel? Revelation 10. Right, Revelation 10. Verse 1, And I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven, clothed with a cloud, and a rainbow was upon his head, and his face was as were the sun, and his feet as pillars of fire. And Sister Wise specifically says that angel was no less a prestige than Jesus Christ himself. So the rep representation of Christ as an angel in Revelation is not, um, is not out of order. It's a standard uh, revelation because Christ, of course, is the mighty angel. He is the archangel. So here we have now a picture of Jesus Christ standing in his Father's presence in the holy place of the heavenly sanctuary, standing there receiving from his people down upon this earth their prayers which come up to him, and when they come up to him, he then mingles them with the incense of his own righteousness, and then these prayers are sent to God in that sanctified, glorified, and strengthened form. Now, I, I know we're all familiar, I think, with what the incense represents. In the book um, Patriarchs and Prophets, we have a very wonderful chapter entitled The Tabernacle and the Services, and I'm looking now at page 353, Patriarchs and Prophets, where it talks about the, um, the role or the symbolism of the incense. In the offering of incense, the priest was brought more directly into the presence of God than in any other act of the daily ministration. As the inner veil of the sanctuary did not extend to the top of the building, the glory of God which was manifested above the mercy seat was partially visible from the first apartments. When the priest offered incense before the Lord, he looked toward the ark, and as the cloud of incense arose, a divine glory descended upon the mercy seat and filled the most holy place, and often so filled both apartments that the priest was obliged to retire to the door of the tabernacle. As in that typical service, the priest looked by faith to the mercy seat, which he could not see, so the people of God are now to direct their prayers to Christ, their great high priest, who unseen by human vision is pleading in their behalf in the sanctuary above. The incense ascending with the prayers of Israel represents the merits and intercession of Christ, his perfect righteousness, which through faith is imputed to his people, and which can alone make the worship of sinful beings acceptable to God. 
before the veil of the most holy place was an altar of perpetual intercession before the holy an altar of continual atonement by blood and by incense Christ I be pardon by blood and by incense God was to be approached symbols point to the great mediator through whom sinners may approach Jehovah and through whom alone mercy and salvation can be granted to the repentant believing soul the statement very very plainly says then that the the incense represents the merits and intercession of Jesus Christ it represents his perfect righteousness which is which through faith is imputed to his people and which can alone make the worship of sinful beings acceptable to God and in the book Sacred Messages volume 1 page 344 the statement there which says that um, uh, when our prayers ascend through these mortal channels and these fallen sinful channels they are unfit to be received directly into God's presence that's an impossibility and uh, therefore all prayers which ascend from these human channels must be sanctified by the incense of the righteousness of Jesus Christ so your prayers then a, 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 a true prayer that, that of faith ascends from you and myself and it first of all goes to Jesus Christ not directly to the Father no prayer can reach God excepting through Christ and then Jesus Christ takes your prayer and my prayer and adds to that the incense of his own spotless righteousness so that your prayer becomes so sanctified so purified so perfected and so powerful that when it comes in the presence of God it comes there as if Christ himself had prayed that prayer now to me that's a tremendous encouragement because when you think of how far heaven is away and when you think of how weak and, and uh, inadequate our prayers really are and, uh, and so forth and then to know that a mighty intercessor stands at God's right hand to take your prayers and to sanctify and make them holy and to present them to the Father so changed so glorified, so powerful that they are holy and completely acceptable in God's presence that must come to every believer as a very, very powerful uh, encouragement and a great, a great strengthening element in our prayers to God. And I must say this, that when I learned that and, and saw the position of Jesus Christ as my intercessor and realized what he's doing for me in respect to my prayers, since that time my prayers have been much more effective, much more powerful, and I've had much better answers to those prayers as well. And I'm sure that every one of us will find the same experience if we will learn to look into in through the open door and see Christ standing there waiting to receive your petitions anxiously to receive them and then gladly to send them on to his father up in heaven once again of course those prayers must be true prayers of faith they must be prayers that uh, have in them the elements of the true signs of prayer because without that of course God cannot uh, give, the, give the answers back again as we'll learn better in just a few moments or in our next study period of two so we have just a few seconds left let's, let's just read again Revelation 8 verses 3 to 5 and another angel came and stood at the altar having a golden censer and there was given unto him much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of all saints upon the golden altar which was before the throne and the smoke of the incense which came with the prayers of the saints ascended up before God out of the angel's hand and the angel took the censer and filled it with fire off the altar and cast it into the earth and there were voices and thunderings and lightnings and an earthquake our time is gone so we'll leave the study period at that point and we'll come back uh, in a few moments to continue our consideration of God's word this morning any questions you'd like to ask on this presentation very good it's now five past or six minutes past eleven let's plan to come back at twenty minutes past to resume our study this morning